Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new 15-minute devotional episode. This is an online video and podcast series for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio. And for listeners to Melvin Gaines's Faith Channel, we appreciate you being here today. My name is Melvin Gaines. As always, this program encourages viewers and listeners to get into God's Word and stay in God's Word by learning and growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this program, we're going to be covering the daily reading of the two-year Bible reading plan for Wednesday, April the 3rd, 2024. I mentioned the two-year Bible reading plan. Our church, Akron Alliance Fellowship, encourages the two-year Bible reading plan, allowing for the reader to cover the Bible over a two-year period. Our devotional here today, which will take about 25 minutes, uh, our program is going to be covering the passages for today, and then we're going to make some verbal comments as we go. But when you participate in the to your Bible reading plan, it normally covers about a seven to ten minute period of Bible reading, followed by another five to eight minutes of time for reflection and prayer over what you've read. That's why we call the devotional the 15 minute devotional, because it takes about 15 minutes of your time every day. We encourage everyone who is involved in this program to get into developing the best possible habits of reading and studying the Bible. And this 15-minute time frame each day gets you started in doing that. You're going to wind up reading more than 15 minutes a day in the Bible as you learn and love the Lord and want to know more about who he is and you want to get into his word more and more. But this is a good way to get started in the process and do so on a consistent basis, which is a real challenge for a lot of people. Reading the Bible daily has been a real challenge for a lot of people. So we hope that this program will help you to get more involved in that process and do so on a regular basis. The passages we're going to be covering for today, <clears throat> pardon me, are Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 through 31, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, Psalm 35, verses 19 to 28, and Proverbs 12, verses 12 to 14. And I neglected to mention that if you wanted to get downloadable copies of the To Your Bible Reading Plan, you can go to our website, akronalliance.org, select the Links tab, and then go to the tab that says To Your Bible Reading Plan. You'll get downloadable copies of that. So we thank you again for joining us today. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, just getting over a little bit of a cold, so we're going to try and muscle through this a little bit here. But in the meantime, let's get started and get into the Word now with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you, Lord, for the teaching that's going to come from the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you bless us, bless the time that we spend in your word today, and we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, everybody. Turn your Bibles and electronic devices to Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 15 to 31. <clears throat> Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 31. And as usual, whenever I start talking, sometimes my cat will respond to that and give me a nudge and say, I know you're here. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking around at for those of you who can see me. Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 31. And uh, let's get into it now. Nehemiah, this is the end of Nehemiah, <clears throat> at the last section of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah does his own narration here. And as you go through this, we're going to see some things where this is a particular section that's going to be talking about additional reforms that are taking place for the people who were formerly exiled and now are returning to Jerusalem. And a lot of this is going to be directed even to those who were in charge, specifically the, the people who are the priests, the people who are involved there. And uh, there's a major contention that Nehemiah has where uh, he actually had been going back. He'd gone back to Persia and had returned. And of course, when you leave and <clears throat> everything appears to be in order and you go away and you come back and what he discovered was things that were not in order at all. And, and that's why he had to make some additional declarations to the people. So let's go to Nehemiah 13, verses 15 through 31. We'll read through it. Starting with verse 15, we're reading in the New Living Translation. In those days, I saw men of Judah treading out their wine presses on the Sabbath, they were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, and bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce 
to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. So I rebuked them for selling their produce on that day. Some men from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing <clears throat> in fish and all kinds of merchandise. They were selling it on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem at that. So I confronted the nobles of Judah. Why are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way? I asked, wasn't it just this sort of thing that your ancestors did that caused our God to bring all this trouble upon us in our city? Now you are bringing even more wrath upon Israel by permitting the Sabbath to be desecrated in this way. <clears throat> then I commanded that the gates of Jerusalem should be shut as darkness fell every Friday evening, not to be opened until the Sabbath ended. I sent some of my own servants to guard the gates so that no merchandise could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Verse 20, the merchants and tradesmen with a variety of wares camped outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I spoke sharply to them and said, what are you doing out here camping around the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. And that was the last time they came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to guard the gates in order to preserve the holiness of the Sabbath. Remember this good deed also, O oh my God. Have compassion on me according to your great and unfailing love. <clears throat> About the same time, I realized that some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Verse 24, Furthermore, half their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or of some other people, and could not speak the language of Judah at all. So I confronted them and called down curses on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I made them swear the name of God. They would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of the land. <clears throat> Wasn't this exactly what led King Solomon of Israel into sin, I demanded? There was no king from any nation who could compare to him, and God loved him and made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by his foreign wives. Verse 27. How could you even think of committing the sinful deed and acting unfaithfully toward God by marrying foreign women? Verse 28. One of the sons of Joaida, some of Eliashib, the high priest, had married a daughter of Sanballat, the Horonite. So I banished him from my presence. Remember them, O oh my God, for they have defiled the priesthood and the solemn vows of the priests and Levites. So I purged out everything foreign and assigned tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. I also made sure that the supply of wood for the altar and the first portions of the harvest were brought at the proper times. Remember this in my favor, O oh God. Okay, that's Nehemiah. 13 verses 15 through 31, that concludes Nehemiah. <clears throat> and this section is all about reform, all about making sure that the Israelites got back to the ways where they were being obedient to the Lord and get got and to turn away from those things that would have them stray and sin against God, frankly. Um, the whole idea of um, the Sabbath being a day of rest was not being followed whatsoever. And so that's when Nehemiah jumped in and told them, you guys are selling, buying and selling products during the Sabbath. It's supposed to be a day of rest. And the other uh, section here about the intermarriage, the potential of intermarriage between uh, those who are in foreign nations, couldn't even speak the language. And, and Nehemiah took it upon himself to even uh, chastise some of them uh, personally uh, by by really just giving giving it to them, giving them some real gas about it and telling them, you guys are doing the very things that Solomon did, and you're, you're, you're sinning against God by being disobedient to his very commands. And ne Nehemiah was all about reform, making sure that things were done the right way. And this was his personal account, almost like a diary, if you want to read it that way, uh, telling the Lord, Lord, this is what I did. This is what I'm, I was uh, called to do. This is what you would have me to do. And, and prayerfully, Lord, they will... Remember, and he's asking, frankly, for God's favor in this as far as making the declaration. And he told them correctly. He told them exactly what was necessary for them to make sure that uh, the Israelites were being obedient. What a, a constant effort it is. <clears throat> and this is, the, I, the more I look at this, this is so common. Even when we look at people today, 
people know the right thing to do, but people just choose not to do it. And the Israelites were this where they were constantly doing this all throughout their history. If you read about it in the Old Testament, there's just a constant scuffle with doing what was right, doing the right thing. Um, and this was something that if, if the people who are in authority, they step aside for a moment, like I said, Nehemiah went back to Persia and now came back and saw all these things taking place. It's like, who's in charge here? Who is the leadership here? And there, there really wasn't any king or anything like that because they were exiled and returning back. But you can see how things were getting quickly out of hand. But the leadership has a lot to do, or a lack of leadership has a lot to do with the way Israel has gone uh, over all these years that we look at in, in Scripture. Prayerfully, the lessons are, are being learned, hopefully today, by those of us who look, and look at this and observe these behaviors, um, that indeed it is important for us to always focus on Jesus Christ, focus on the Lord, focus on doing the right thing, focus on doing what he would have us to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, that's, <clears throat> pardon me, that's the takeaway that we have for this section here. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, excuse me, by the way. 1 Corinthians 11, let's look at verses 13 through 16. It's a short section. And this is the section in scripture uh, of the two-year Bible reading plan for today that is talking about head coverings, and, and it's referring to more than head coverings, but I want you to uh, look at it, and let's just go over this very quickly. 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. All right, and of course, this is Paul speaking, and this is a section that's now having to do with appearance and what's the proper way to look and appear uh, publicly uh, when it comes to your service for the Lord and and what, what's appropriate in a church. Verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy for it has been given to her as a covering? Verse 16, but if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this and neither do God's other churches. Now, <clears throat> this can be taken literally, or we need to also look at it from the standpoint of the context of the Corinthian church. Back then, it was almost anything goes. People kind of did what they wanted to do. And here, Paul is trying to provide some sort of order and some sort of position. It's not going to be the law, and it's not going to be something that churches are necessarily going to require. But we're looking at how, how, how are we to live in an orderly manner in the church? Uh, J. Vernon McGee made a comment in the section about verse 13 about where it says, Judge for yourselves is a right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head. He went one step further and referred to the fact that a woman uh, really needs to be just conscious of her sexuality and making sure that she is not doing something to cause someone to stumble. Now, that is a real problem in today's church. And, you know, we can talk about the head covering part and, and what you do with your hair and all those things, but he went one step further and even mentioned about how sometimes women, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, and I'm not saying this in any way to be pejorative against women, but, you know, there's sometimes there's an extra, extra motivation involved when, when a woman in Pearson Church and wears clothing that is anything but modest. I'll leave it there. I think that's the proper way to look at it. And so that's there is an order that needs to be maintained when we're talking about going into a public place and we're talking about going for the purposes of what? Worshiping in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What's appropriate in that situation? I'm going to let you think about that. And you're welcome to comment here about those things. But I think it's appropriate... If we take the context of this passage and look at it for today's purposes, we know that um, it's important for women to be dressed and behave in, su in such a way where they are not causing someone to stumble. I think that's the proper way to look at it. And, and that's, an, that's a real issue in today's church. And let's look at about the issue about long hair. Uh, is it disgraceful for a man to have long hair? This is 
This is a comment that Paul is making based upon the tre trends and the time uh, that they were living in. Now, remember, just so that you we're clear about this, too, there was a point in time where the Nazarites, if we look at um, the people who were Nazarites, they were the ones who didn't shave their heads and they let it grow. And, of course, they did so, and they got a lot of attention for that. And sometimes it wasn't very favorable attention, but... They were convicted by God to let their hair grow, and that's exactly what they did. And we see the example of that when we look at Samson. Samson was a Nazarite, and he indeed had his hair grow, let his hair grow long. And so he was an interesting fellow because he stood out amongst everybody else around him. And, of course, his behaviors uh, demonstrated that as well, too. I don't want to digress from what we're talking about here. but So today we look at long hair. Um, in the in the body of Christ, we're under the we're under the grace of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ that we're living in today, and people have long hair or short hair, and they're not to be judged so per se for that as long as it's kept up well and it's well you know uh, it's not looking raggedy. That's the thing that we have to make sure that we're aware of as well too. There's a there's a there are rules for men and rules for women today when it comes to the proper way of approaching church and the proper way of approaching uh, our Lord and Savior. We do what is right. We don't do things to, to get attention, and we don't do things to be rebellious. We do them because we want to maintain a certain amount of order, and I think that's the the greatest takeaway from, from this particular section. I don't think I can really add to this. I, I'm well, I welcome your comments in this section uh, because at the end of the day, we have to recognize that there are some things that are very important for us to look at here when we're looking at this whole thing about um, how much hair do you have and the head coverings and all that. We, we have to go back and where it says in Ephesians 5 where we need to, uh, husbands uh, love their wives as uh, Christ loves the church. And so there's a certain amount of behavior that comes from how we are to live and how we are to set an example uh, as the men in a church as well too. And the women respond to that and, and they in, in tune, they are also in tune to the fact that uh, they need to be responsive to being uh, the head, the head being Christ in their lives as well, too, and living in such a manner where we're honoring and glorifying him. Okay, let's go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 28. This is a Psalm of David. Uh, as you may recall in past programs, we've told you that David wrote about half of the Psalms, uh, penned half of the Psalms just about in the in Scripture that we read about. In this particular one, it appears that this one was written around the time, if we were to look at the time of persecution in 1 Samuel 24 that he faced with uh, against Saul. Saul was the one who was persecuting David. Saul kind of knew that he um that David was a rival of his and and Saul really wasn't following the Lord and was just continuing to try to dog David and frankly try to kill him because he knew that David was eventually going to be the the one who was over that would be the king of Israel. But let's just read the passage Psalm 35 verses 19 through 28. Uh, verse 19, don't let my treacherous enemies rejoice over my defeat. Don't let those who hate me without cause gloat over my sorrow. Verse 20, they don't talk of peace. They plot against innocent people who mind their own business. They shout, aha, aha, with our own eyes, we saw him do it. Oh, Lord, you know all about this. Do not stay silent. Do not abandon me now, O oh Lord. Wake up, rise to my defense. Take my case, my God and my Lord. Verse 24, declare me not guilty, O Lord my God, for you give me, you give justice. Don't let my enemies laugh about me in my troubles. Don't let them say, look, we got what we wanted. Now we will eat him alive. May those who rejoice at my troubles be humiliated and disgraced. May those who triumph over me be covered with shame and dishonor. But give great joy to those who came to my defense. Let them continually say, Great is the Lord who delights in blessing his servant with peace. Verse 28, Then I will proclaim your justice and I will praise you all day long. 
David tells it like it is here. He really does uh, speak. He has a very special relationship with the Lord, and you can tell by the way he communicates with him. He is praying, frankly, that uh, he is not defeated. He is praying for his enemies to be defeated. He is praying for protection. He's praying about those individuals who plot evil and only want to see him come to ruin. And he's asking for the Lord to provide justice on his behalf because he is only one man. He can't do anything about the numerous numbers of enemies, the people who are uh, following Saul, the people who are responding to Saul, Saul's soldiers, they're all following his orders. So he truly is outnumbered. David has a small band of people who are willing to defend, to defend him and travel with him, but I think he's outnumbered in, in that situation too. But we want to recognize that he was running away from Saul because he was in trouble. He was having difficulty. He was having a hard time. and But even with that, even in the fact that he was having a difficult time, he never, he had a couple of chances to actually wipe Saul out and, and rid Saul of being, uh, of being a burden or a nuisance to him. He had a chance to kill him, but he never did. And that's because he was being faithful to the fact that Saul was indeed the Lord's anointed and he was being obedient to the Lord. And so from that standpoint, yeah, um, David was living in a manner of righteousness and, and mo much more so than Saul was. But how interesting is it that he decided not to take Saul's life, even though Saul was trying to take his? I think that says something about David's character, David trusting in the Lord for his protection. And he's setting the example for all of us, too, because every time somebody disagrees with us or comes against us as individuals, we don't want to wipe them out. We don't want to kill them. That's not the way to, to behave. That's not the way to act. He's setting an example for us and showing us that, frankly, um, what we, if we stand in the Lord, stand on the Lord's word, live in such a manner where we're honoring him, that's sufficient. And everything else, if people oppose us, we let the Lord handle those things. We don't take matters into our own hands to resolve those issues. Amen. That's the important lesson from all of that. And I hope that you can see that here, uh, looking at the life of David. David wasn't perfect. We already know that. We already know that David made mistakes later on in his reign as a king. But in these early times, before he even assumed being a king, he was indeed uh, the man that, that God loved. Um, and he was his, uh, basically saw the heart of David and saw where he was and honored David because of his heart. And that's where we want to always land when it comes to our responsibility, when it comes to being a servant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Proverbs 12, verses 12 through 14. That's going to conclude our reading for today. Proverbs 12, verses 12 through 14. As you know, in Proverbs, there is a, a lesson, there's a teaching that's taking place here for anybody who reads Proverbs. And it's about behaviors, and we know about good behaviors and bad behaviors, and we know the difference between the two. But Proverbs reinforces this uh, statement over and over again as we look at the passage. And it typically involves wisdom and foolishness. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at what it says here. Proverbs 12, verses 12 through 14. Again, the New Living Translation, uh, follow along in your version. Thieves are jealous of each other's loot, but the godly are well-rooted and bear their own fruit. The wicked are trapped by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Wise words bring many benefits and hard work brings rewards. Okay. That is, of course, this is self-explanatory. We recognize what, that, what this is saying here. And we see that there is no honor among thieves. That's the first thing I thought of when I read verse 12 in Proverbs 12. Thieves are jealous of each other's loot, but the godly are well-rooted and bear their own fruit. And you ever notice how those who are ungodly, they wind up turning against each other sometimes. They don't trust each other. They, um, somebody may rob someone and, and they may uh, want to um, hide the money and theoretically they'll divide it amongst themselves. But I've seen situations where those people wind up getting wiped out and because the one person who's a thief there wants to, does want, doesn't want to split the money. They want to get rid of the other person. There's no honor among thieves, everybody. And But the godly are well-rooted. I love that. Those who are really following the Lord Jesus Christ have, are well-rooted in where they are 
And while the people who are deceitful, they get trapped, they, they wind up getting caught in their own lies and situations, godly people don't have to lie. They tell the truth. Wise words bring many benefits and hard work brings rewards. These are people who are living in a godly manner and honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is where they will reap the rewards. They will reap the benefit of such a relationship with him. You just wish that other people would just learn from that, right? Amen. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So uh, we just thank you again for joining us today. Let's go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for your presence today. We pray, Lord, now that you'll bless us and keep us. We thank you for the time spent in your word today. And we pray that you'll just uh, bless us and keep us, Lord, as we continue to remain steadfast and consistent in reading your word each and every day. We thank you. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me for today's 15-minute devotional program. We appreciate you being here today. God bless you and take care of yourselves. We'll see you around the corner and see you next time.